When it comes to the art history of ancient India, the period after the fall of the Mauryan Empire holds a special place. But for us to understand what was special and interesting about the post-Mauryan art, we have to first talk about the art that preceded it. When we look at the art of pre-Mauryan and Mauryan period, we find that these arts were drastically different from the arts of post-Mauryan period. So when we look at the architecture of of uh, pre-modern period and modern period, we find that most of the time these structures and monuments were made of wood and bamboo. And that is why we see that when historians and archaeologists try to find evidence of these structures, it is quite hard because wood and bamboo did not survive for long in the climate of India. The second important aspect of the art that preceded the postmodern art is that most of the time it is linked to royalty. For example, take the Mauryan art. We find that when it comes to the Mauryan art, we have Ashokan capitals and pillars. Now, most of the time, these pillars were constructed in order to propagate the message of Ashok. So that is why they are linked to royalty. Apart from these capitals and pillars of the Mauryan period, we see that uh, in this period, there were also some sculptures of Yaksha and Yakshani. And most scholars are of the opinion that these Yaksha and Yakshanis of the modern period were constructed by the patronage of the royalty. So here again, we see that, you know, royalty is involved in the making of art. So basically what we see is that the art and architecture of the pre modern and modern period has two important aspects. Firstly, Particularly when we are talking about architecture, most of the time it is made of wood and bamboo. Secondly, we see that when it comes to sculptures and different forms of art, most of it is connected either directly or indirectly with royalty. But in the post-modern period, that is the period after the fall of the modern empire, we see that both of these aspects changed significantly. For example, let's talk about the first aspect of the pre-modern and modern art. That is, most of the time, the structures of this period were made of wood and bamboo. What we see in the post-modern period is that wood and bamboo are being replaced by bricks and stones. If we take the example of the structures and monuments that were made in the post-modern period, we see that these were made of stone and bricks. So let's take the example of Sanchi and Barhut. In both the cases, we see that stone and brick is predominantly used by artisans and those who were constructing these monuments. The use of stone and bricks is important for us because these structures that were constructed in the most modern period have survived up until this day. So that is why we see that stone and brick provided a durability which wood and bamboo could not provide. So this was one aspect in which we find that the art of the postmodern period was different from the art that preceded it. Now let's take the second important aspect. Now in the modern period, we have seen that most of the art is linked to royalty. But in the postmodern period, we see that this is not the case. Most of the time, it is the common people who are funding and patronizing the making of art. So in order to explain this, we are going to take the example of Sanchi Stoop. Sanchi Stoop, as most of you would know, was built by Emperor Ashok in around 250 BC. And it was during this time we see that the dome-like structure of a stoop, which is called Anda, was encased in bricks by Emperor Ashok. Apart from this, we see that the railings around the stoop during this period were made of wood. But in the post-modern period, that is around 100 BC, we see that major developments in Sanchi stoop took place. For example, the size of the stoop itself was enlarged and it became twice of its original size. Apart from the size of the dome, we see that the railings, which were earlier made of wood, are now being replaced with stone railings. But the most significant addition to this structure was the installation of four gateways or toranas. These toranas were made of stone and on it beautiful 
sculptures were also sculpted. Now, what is interesting about all of these works that were carried out in 100 BC is that most of the time it is the common people who are funding this. We know this because there are some 631 inscriptions that is found in and around Sanchi Stoop that tells us who funded what. Art historian Vidya Dahejia has analyzed these 631 inscriptions and from these 631 inscriptions, we find that there are some thousand individuals who funded all of the construction that happened in 100 BC. In her analysis, Vidya Dahejia found out that of these 631 donative inscriptions, donative inscriptions mean inscriptions that tells us who is the donor and what he is donating. So of these 631 donative inscription, she found that only three are related to royalty. That is the donors of these three inscriptions have some connection with royalty. So let's look at these three inscription. The first is by a chief artist of Satvahana King Sri Satakarni. The second is by a royal scribe that is Raj Lipikar. But we are not sure of which royal dynasty or king he belonged. The third is by a queen whose name is Vakula. But we are not sure of which dynasty or royal house this queen belonged. So these are the only three inscription that has connection to royalty. Otherwise, the other inscription are from the common people. Now, what is even more interesting is that of the remaining 600 some inscription, we find that the single largest group is of monks and nuns, that is bhikkhu and bhikkhuni. And we find that there are some 200 inscription that belongs to monks and nuns. And most of the time we see that these monks and nuns are donating some railing pillars, stone slabs, etc. Now here, another important fact which we learn is that bhikkhuni and bhikkhu also own some material goods, particularly money. Now this is quite important because when we read the Buddhist literature, it appears that when a monk and a nun become part of a Sangha, he does not own anything. And this is the impression which one gets when one reads Buddhist literature. But here, when we see the donative inscriptions of monks and nuns, we see that they have some money and this money they used for donations. So here you can see how the writing in a particular Buddhist text is different from the reality. Apart from monks and nuns, we see that the second largest inscription belongs to ordinary householders, which are called Gahapati and housewives which are called grahani then we see that individuals that belongs to different professions like lekhaka lekhaka is a writer and sotika sotika is a weaver and kamika kamika is artisan so all of these different individuals who belong to different occupations were also donating now another important aspect of these inscriptions is that apart from individuals there were also groups that were donating. For example, we have an example of a assembly of Buddhist monk from the town of Dharmavardhan. So this assembly of Buddhist monk have also donated some objects. Another important point about these donative inscriptions is that we can also get information about the location of these donors. So what we see is that most of the time these donors are located in the vicinity of Sanchi Stup. So that is uh, these donors belong to the area around Sanchi. But what we see is that the city of Ujjain and the people of Ujjain city were the second largest donors who donated to Sanchi Stoop. Then we have some donors who belong to far away places like Pushkar or Pathan in Maharashtra. So here what we see is that the location of individual is also quite broad. Thus, what we see is that in Sanchi around 100 BC, the construction that is going on was primarily funded by the common people. But 
this phenomena is not unique to sanchi alone we see that other important post modern structures were constructed primarily by the funding from the common people and it is the common people who had donated large amount of money and substance to these works so this is what is special about the post modern art and architecture now if you want to know about the origin of indian art i have made a video on it please watch it thank you for watching